You're tuned in to the Daily BS. Do you believe it? Sports and culture combined into one. Michael on the drive across the lane. Turnaround shot. Got it. 63 for Jordan. Are you kidding me? He did what? The Daily BS begins. Bazinga. <laughs> right now. Hey, googly moogly. Hadouken. Hey, this promises to be fun. Can't wait. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, folks. Brian Snow is here and with you, and we're ready to get down to some daily BS business, sports and culture combined into one. You can hear a replay of this show one hour after its completion, and the premiere of the Daily BS podcast will also be available one hour after this show's completion. We are on all kinds of networks and stations all across the country. Well, Let me use my normal phrase in the region, across the nation and around the world. So if you're in your car on the drive home and you got me via your phone, via your laptop, via whatever, welcome to the Daily BS and let old Brian take you home with some great sports and culture talk. All right. Enough introductions. Let's get started. We roll on here on the program and I am excited to welcome One half of the Legacy Maker Sports Show, which is another guilty pleasure of mine, this is Jake Quimby, and he joins me right now. Jake Hugh, what's up? How you doing, Snowman? Doing good, doing good. Now, these guys had me on their show to preview the NFC Championship, and I warned them ahead of time that Green Bay was going to get blasted. So I I get a little bit of pleasure of saying... I was right. Green Bay got blasted. <laughs> I was just trying to, you know, look out for my my brother and I know. you know my friend and give him a little comfort. But yeah, they got they got wrecked. Why? And then they draft a let's let's look, dive right in. And then they draft a quarterback. Why would the Packers do that? <laughs> and well. Some of the things that you see from Jordan Love, uh, not the the previous year, but the year before that, he showed very good signs of you know being kind of uh, I don't want to say Pat Mahomes because some of the angles that he throws at, I mean nobody can do that, but he's got a lot <laughs> yeah. of good intangibles that you need for a quarterback, and for him to fall down. That far, and with Aaron being 37, why not take a guy, let him set, let him learn? I know Aaron doesn't play well with others, but he got to get over himself <laughs> and look what's best for the Packers. I, I love that. Aaron Rodgers is definitely a diva. From what I've hear, I'm hearing, though, he did reach out to Jordan Love the same way or not th- not in the same way that Brett Favre tried to reach out didn't reach out to Aaron Rodgers. So there's that. But as you said, Aaron Rodgers has got to get over himself and some of these Aaron Rodgers fans and I love them dearly. They got to realize Aaron's old. Aaron's 37 now. <laughs> right. I mean I'm so skeptical cuz you know we traded both of our fourth away and I was hoping to get uh, like a James Morgan or somebody like that to put behind Tom Brady. Because yeah. I don't, I don't like Tom Brady. I don't like Gronk, but I like winning because I haven't done much of that in the last, you know, 12 plus years. But, you know, I, I want somebody to learn from them. I, I laugh and because I, I, I laugh because I feel your pain because until this year I went through the same kind of pain with San Francisco. So trust me, I understand. You guys got a one heck of a steal with that trade for Trent Williams. Yeah, I, I tell you. Yeah, I mean, Daly retiring, Trent Williams coming in. I mean, the, the, amazing. And with him taking that time off, you're going to get another three or four years. Hmm. And here's so, the other, uh, here's the other thing, they jettisoned to Forrest Buckner, send him to Indianapolis, which put a big smile on my wife's face because she's a big time Colts fan. But then they draft Javon Kinlaw, and he's a perfect fit for that defensive line. 
and the defensive scheme. But I understand. Darrell and I actually talked about this because they didn't want to pay Buckner. Right. And they get Kinlaw. And Kinlaw, in my opinion, is a bit more of a monster at, you know, the point of attack than what, you know, Buckner is. So mm-hmm. they played it great. I mean, they played us, yeah, you know, by making us flip one pick with them. Yep. Because honestly, if we didn't flip one pick to give them a little more, they were going to take worse. And I love the pick of worse. I think he'll be a better left tackle than Donovan Smith. Right. But yeah. you guys didn't have many picks after the first round. Mm-hmm. So we had so, to go for I mean, it. We had to go for it now. We oh, had to go for it now. Yeah. There's so many different things. Uh, I mean, I feel for the the Philly fans though because the Jalen Hurts one was like a kick in the nuggets to everybody, man. <laughs> yeah does does that signal the end of the Carson Wentz era? Yeah, well, I want to say no, just because when Wentz is healthy and knock on wood, when you know, he's a great quarterback, and right. they gave up the farm to move up to get him. Mm-hmm. But they don't have a, a justifiable backup for him. And Jalen Hurts is not a bad quarterback, and he does everything that Wentz can, and but stays healthy. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's going to be it's going to be a health question again with Wentz. I don't think he's played a full season yet. If I'm if I'm right. No, I you're one hundred percent correct. I believe uh, j- he just he takes those hits, and he is not built to be a runner at all. You know, and uh, then again, you know, you Peters is gone, mm-hmm. and you know, they got uh, uh, what was his name Dillard last year. Yeah, and, and Dillard is not Peter. I'm sorry. <laughs> He's not. There, there's he really no isn't. replacing a Jason Peters type of player. There's no replacing but, him. There's no replacing him at all. And plus, will the receivers be healthy? Because half of their well, receiving core was injured. Well, yeah, yeah. But Jefferson had the uh, Liz Frank, and then you had uh, or Jeffries. I'm sorry. Jackson's always broken because. He's old now. <laughs> yeah. Um, JJ uh, Whiteside, I can never say his name. Uh, he never got a chance to get on the field. So no. it, it just, this is a very, there's still so much talent at wide receiver. They need to take like six more, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you think of the Cowboys drafting CD Lamb to pair him opposite Amari Cooper? I. I actually said this earlier to a Cowboys fan I know. I'm impressed with their draft so far. They, I, I've, I've gotten really nothing negative to say about it. Mm-hmm. That I, you know, CD falls to them, and then the you got Cooper and then Gallup. Yeah, he was no slump monster. So I I love it. Absolutely love what they've done. And it hurts me because I hate the Cowboys. <laughs> Just out of pure, because everybody loves them, I, I can't stand the Cowboys, but they've done great. Yeah, they have. Uh, I I figured I'd explain this to you. I didn't get a chance to do it on your show. This is the biggest reason why I hate the Cowboys. When Joe Montana hit Dwight Clark in the back of the end zone, it shut the Cowboy fans up and shut the Cowboys up. I've been a 49er fan. Mm-hmm. I've been a 49er fan since then. My fourth grade teacher was a Cowboy fan, and she was talking junk all week saying, we're going to beat San Francisco. And finally, I got tired. And I said, no, you're not. We're going to beat you guys. I earned a few cupcakes for it because I want to bet, but <laughs> Montana may be a 49er for life. And speaking of the 49ers, what do you think of them drafting Brandon Nayuk? Again, second straight year they go with a receiver late in the first round. Uh, they, they kind of had to replace um, Sanders 
And then also, if you look, uh, I've heard whispers that Godwin might be on the move today. Yeah. Yeah. I, so, I heard I heard those whispers also. Talking dr- talking I, NFL okay. Draft with Jay Quimby, one half of the Legacy Makers Sports Podcast. Besides Jordan Love and Jalen Hurts, what do you think, or which pick do you think was the biggest surprise? Um, biggest surprise so far. Um, I mean, I can go like fifty thousand different ways here, Snowman. <laughs> I mean, it's okay. Biggest surprise, which everybody called it, but I don't like, uh, and everybody's grading it and saying it's great. I I like this player's character, his fire, but Tua, I I don't I don't like Tua going that high to them. I uh, you know, Tua's got way way too many health issues. Yep. Uh, I think we're going to see Carson Wentz all over again because he likes to run. Yep. Just, you know, get, and, you know, you go back and you can, I, what, three different leg injuries mm-hmm. that I can think of off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. I, I, mean, I, I don't like that pick for Miami to start building on. I, I thought they would go offensive line to protect the quarterback. Oh, I agree 100% with you. I thought they would go the same way. You know, uh, I they tried to move up to one to get Burrow and right. offered all three first-round picks they had plus next year's first. And Cincinnati said no. Yeah. Which, will time will tell whether it was a good good idea or not. Mm-hmm. Well, so, they, get, they, they, they draft uh, T. Higgins for Burrow to throw to. But I've said this on the on my program and you've heard me say it and I posted it I'm not too high on Burrow a flash in the pan kind of year and he's the Heisman Trophy winner and he's the number one overall pick not to mention the national champion he did all that in a year I want to see some consistency from Joe Burrow we're going to find that out in Cincinnati this coming year well I I got to see a lot of what where he was in the spring game and a lot of practice tape on him where he lost out the starting job at Ohio State, Dwayne Haskins. Yeah. And, I mean, in that offense, and you lose out to Haskins, who honestly only started one game, you know, he wasn't even a starter in high school. Right. Right. So – it, it just makes – I agree with you, you know. And then you look at all the offensive talent around him, any person that went there to be a quarterback would have just shot up the board. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Indeed. Indeed. So it'll, it'll be a lot so, – it's going to be a lot to see. <laughs> it's going to be a lot to see, man. It's going to be a lot to see. I mean, there's so many variables into it, um, you know. Like the Browns pick, they got got another LSU stud, yep. air quote, in the second round in Grant DePitt. But once again, he was a guy that had ankle is- issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, a guy I've seen fall that's still on the board, hold on, unless the Jets pick him right here, is Bryce Hall. And Bryce Hall was a top 10 pick at the beginning of uh, last season. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just uh, injuries can do so much to different things. Mm-hmm. You know, I I think Burrow will put butts in the stands for Cincinnati. You know, change a little bit. But if I you don't T. have Higgins a complete, pick. but if you don't have a complete offense, and I love T Higgins going to Cincinnati, you can put all the butts in the stands that you want. If you ain't putting wins on the board, they're going to disappear again. I, I completely agree with you. And that that defense is older than you and I combined. <laughs> so, um, you know, they got a lot of the uh, guys from Minnesota. Yep. Uh, brought them in secondary-wise from the free agency. 
I just, uh, that defense, I, I don't trust that defense. And the offense is going to have to put up a lot of points to keep up. Yeah, that's about the size of it. I'm going to have this man back on later on this week to wrap up the entire draft. And we're going to start going team by team. And I'm going to do that with, do that with a lot of my guests coming up here in the future. This man is Jay Quimby, one half of the Legacy Makers Sports Podcast. It's a very guilty pleasure of mine. It's a wonderful show. I invite you guys to go check it out. JQ, a pleasure, my man. I look forward to having you on a lot more. I, I appreciate it, sir. Thank you. Have a blessed day. More, more, I say, after this. <laughs> combined into one so i had one half of the legacy maker sports podcast on the program and now i get the other half and mr durrell owens a very dear friend of mine durrell how are you man what's up snowman how's it going brother it's weird (laughs) besides the draft no sports going on People tell me, you know, you got no reason to rant and rave on the Lakers, and you know why I do that. <laughs> yeah, I, haven't, I haven't had Darrell on in a while, so we're just going to catch up on a lot of things. First and foremost, I told you your team would get their butts kicked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, let's let's just be honest. I mean, you know, as a I, as a fan, I had to go in there and say, "All right, you got to have some hope." Right. But I'll be honest with you. I knew weeks before. I was like, "Ah, this is not the matchup I wanted. <laughs> this is not the matchup I wanted." So, I mean, you know, it happened. You know, it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. mean, I the only thing I the only thing I thought about it is if I felt like if we could have scored early. Yeah, maybe we could have kept it close. If and, it, and, and if y'all would have gotten, times, yeah, it was just bad. If y'all would have gotten a touchdown and made it uh, either tied the game seven apiece or made it ten seven, you know, I figured it would be a ball game. But twenty seven no, to nothing. Not at all. 
<laughs> not at all. It was bad early, and you know it, it's been a rough. It's been a rough. It, the last the, the, we've been in what three NFC Championship games since yep. Aaron Rodgers went to the Super Bowl, and uh, all three of them have been just terrible. blowouts. Uh, They've you know, been blowouts. I mean, the Seahawks should have won the Seahawks one. Yes, that was ours. They had five minutes ago. Should have won that one. Right. Got destroyed against Atlanta and Atlanta, and then get destroyed in San Francisco. <laughs> and my whole thing is Aaron Rodgers has never had an NFC Championship game at home. No, every single one has been on the road. Yep, and I, I, I'm just like man. Can we just get one at home and see what happens? <laughs> <laughs> now you know why I wanted that one seed so bad. But yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it would have made that much of a difference, but at least we would have. At least it would have felt a little bit better if we had a shot at home. But, and, and the crazy know, hey, man, thing the is, I, I mentioned this to a mutual buddy of ours, Trey Larkins, who's going to be on the show later this week. I mentioned this to I'm him. I, me- I mentioned this to him, and I mentioned it to you. How can you be blown out by a team that threw the ball eight? times well you know I, this is something i i said right after the game i think the last time the packers had a good run a true good run defense was 1997 yes i feel like it's been 20 years uh if you look back in the last i mean we may have had a couple years here and there where we were all right i think maybe like a four or five years back we were like seventh in the league in run defense which i couldn't believe right. and then when we went right back to the old way the next season <laughs> And that was the season that I think Aaron had got hurt. Yes. So it was just like we haven't had a good run defense since the days of Reggie White Incorporated. Yeah. So it was, even the year we won the Super Bowl, we weren't phenomenal. Uh, and I think that with that, we just eventually, you know, you got to, ah, you know, we got to <laughs> fix the run. Uh, and, and I don't know if it's ever going to happen. So, man, I don't know if it's ever going to happen. <laughs> well, it's, well, it didn't happen that Sunday when y'all allowed, and I can't believe I'm going to say this even though it's my team, 285 rushing yards. I, I believe it. So, man, I mean, uh, let's let's <laughs> let's take it back to 2013 when Kaepernick almost ran for 200. Right. He did it twice. <laughs> he did it twice. So, uh, for me, and then that's another thing. Playing San Francisco in the playoffs, I was like, ah, come on. Oh, can we do it? It's got to be somebody else. So give me somebody different. You right. know, somebody that I was like, oh, maybe there's a chance. And I'm not saying – I don't think we – I feel, still feel like we could have won that game if we mm-hmm. – you know, had a jump start. It just yep. it just wasn't going to happen. As soon as I saw how that first drive went for Seth, I said, oh, this is not good. <laughs> I said, and I knew it. I said, more Seth's about to hit it. I said, 300 yards rushing. It's going to be stupid. And so that's what happened. And, and, you know, and Raheem I mean, Mostert dropped 229 on you guys. Rushing. That's what I'm saying. 229. <laughs> Come on. 229 God, and four scores. He, he dropped 229 and four scores. Man? I've shared this story. I shared this story on the program. And I, I I have to share it again. Um, my wife's team is the Indianapolis Colts, and we always watch uh, the Colts games, and we get and we get into it. She's never had a chance to see me get into it with my team, which of course is the Forty Nine ers, until this year. And when the <laughs> NFC champion, I I gotta share this when the NFC championship happened, and. Bless her heart, she says, I'm only going to make it through the first quarter, and then I got to crash because we had both been working most of the day. I said, all right. Mm-hmm. When Mostert scored that first touchdown, I scared everybody in the house because I was that excited. <laughs> <laughs> I was that excited. My my wife comes up to me, and I'm banging on the desk. My wife just is just looking at me with this big grin on her face, and I caught myself, and I said, oh, I'm so sorry. And she says, is this not – and she's just as calm as ever. She goes, is this not your team? Yes. Have you not been a fan of this team forever? Yes. Then shut up and cheer for them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and next time, Frisco scored a touchdown, made it 17 nothing. My dog leapt in my lap. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, I, I just I just know I sat in my my chair and <laughs> as it started to happen, I just I just I started shaking my head and I was like, why 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 you know? And then we were seventeen nothing and we were driving. I'm like, okay, if we score here, yes. you know, yeah, I mean at least it gives you some breath of life. And what happened? Fumble. He fumbled said, the ball. It's just not meant to, <laughs> I said, it's just a, and it was a good drive. It was a good package drive, like a good normal package drive. And I said, this is looking good. And then it happened. And I said, man, this is not. This <laughs> is yeah. not what I need. Armstead so, I mean, stripped you know, him. What it is. Armstead stripped him, 
and uh, Buckner recovered. Buckner recovered. Go down, get a field goal, make it twenty to nothing. And I know so many. I know so many Packer fans. They were messaging me, going, "Are you kidding me?" <laughs> deja vu, man. It was deja vu all over again. You know, I didn't even watch the first the, the first game that happened uh, last season. I didn't yeah. even watch it yeah. because I was coming back from um, I was coming back from a Redskins game that I was covering. Right, and I was on the way back from the Redskins game, and I'm like, "Oh, okay, Green Bay's got the eight o'clock game tonight." I think it was the Redskins Lions. So yes. I come back. I said, "Well, I'll catch it when I get home." Uh, so I sit down. I get comfortable. As soon as I sat down and got comfortable, we're already down 10 nothing, And then y'all scored, I think, like Nick Bosa, something Nick Bosa did. And I said, you know what? Uh-uh. I already know how this one's going. I cut the thing off. I said, I'm going to bed. <laughs> I was, it, was just, it, it was the vibe, man. I can, I, I can always tell when it's going to be a really bad Packer game. And that is, it was 10 nothing. And usually I'm like, okay, we can make But just the way it went down, I said, no. Nah. Not in San Francisco, not tonight. And, and then so I went in. Uh, and, and then it's, thir- <laughs> it's thirteen nothing. The Packers. I think the Packers were still in the game even when it was thirteen nothing. And then Garoppolo hits Debo Samuel on a crossing route, and was right. and went I and just, flew untouched to the end zone. <laughs> I mean, what do you do? Well, what do you do when you can't? You know. And now here's the here's the funny thing, Snowman. I'm sitting here looking at the draft. You know, I've been looking yeah. at the draft and all that stuff. Yep. And you know, all I keep hearing is. You know, the Packers are, or LaFleur, you know, since him and Shanahan are tight. You know, guess what type of <laughs> offense the Packers are going to try to run now? Oh, they're going to go try to run San Francisco's offense. You know what? Great. <laughs> you know, that's why That's why you don't see Aaron Rodgers getting any weapons. Right. You know, I mean, I love A.J. I love AJ Dillon. Yep. I, I think A.J. Dillon's a great pickup just, just in case Aaron Jones decides to walk next year or we don't pay him, which is a – potentially good thing and it, it, it would not surprise me if Green Bay doesn't pay him the money he wants they, right. they've never when it comes to big free agents and sometimes they sign there, a few of them he's been their saving grace for two years he's been I, their saving grace I, that doesn't mean anything you see with Blake Martinez gone Blake True. Martinez has been top top four no, he's been a top two in tackles every year he's been in the league yep. he's never been the number one person he's been number two every year every in the year and yes, year. he may he may not be the best coverage guy, but he stops. He, he's he's a he's a he's a good tackler. He's a he's a, he's a linebacker. I'm mm-hmm. not saying he's the greatest, but he went out there. He got his money from the Giants. Not mad. We let Frackle go. Another great young linebacker. Yep. When they brought the Smith brothers in, he get he took a step back. So you know it's it's one it's one of those things where it's like they're going to pay a couple people, and I don't I don't know if because Aaron Jones is going to demand. 15 to 16 million dollars. He's yeah, going to want easy. that Zeke money. He's going to, especially if he has another year like he did last year, he's right. going to want the Zeke money. He's, he's if he gets the Zeke it. money, he gets this, you know, the, if he gets the Zeke money, potentials down the road, Saquon Barkley money, I'm telling you right now, they're going to let him go. That's yeah. why you see this. This is why you see AJ Dillon in the second round. Yeah. And I think they probably, if, if one of the other guys like Taylor or somebody had dropped that far, they would have grabbed him. True. So I, that's where they're moving to. <laughs> That's where they're moving to. Trying to they're, they're just trying to be the Forty ers I got. I got to pose. Former I got to pose this question. I got to pose this question. Why did y'all draft Jordan Love? You know, um, <laughs> you know, I, I've been I've been thinking about this one. Well, obviously now for a couple of days, and you know, when I first when it first happened, I, I knew I knew I've been, I've been knowing that it was going to happen within the next two years. Right. You know, this is around the same time they did with Favre. You know, Gudicic is is you know he's a Ted Thompson disciple. Yep. Uh, he's a little bit he's a little bit more open though. He'll do a little bit more than Ted will do. Yes. But I, I had a feeling it was coming, and so um, I didn't. I felt that we would do it. Or at least my personal one was maybe let's do a second round, third round. Right. You can grab somebody there. We need a backup quarterback. Mm-hmm. You can grab somebody there. There'll be a couple guys. You know, Easton, whatever. Mm-hmm. So when I saw that they moved up, I said no. I already knew. I knew immediately because they've been, they've been, they had, they had, they had already sent people out to see him. And it's not that I don't want him. I right. be honest with you, I do like him overall. I think yeah. if we could have got him in the second round, that would have been phenomenal. But there was two guys in the first round, Snowman, that was just looking at me and smiling. And their names are Patrick <laughs> Queen. Yep. The names are Patrick Queen, which would have been amazing. Out of and then the only well, there's a couple of receivers left, but Denzel Mims was there, and and but the man that I wanted the most. Because I saw him in the ACC championship game when Virginia got stumped by Clemson with T. Higgins. T. Higgins. The kid can catch, yeah, T. Yeah, T. Higgins can catch the ball, snowman. Yeah, man. And, and both of them, two, two picks afterwards. Queen, two picks later, Higgins. Higgins. Ah, yep. <laughs> That's how they did me, snowman. That's how they did me. So overall, I like the pick. 
I just wish it was in the second round. Yeah. Or, and I could have felt a little bit better about it. Um, but they don't, if they don't give me a receiver today, <laughs> I'm going to throw something. Oh, man. Don't throw anything. If, your wife and your you know, kids will get upset. Don't throw anything. I might have throw something, though, man. Don't, <laughs> don't throw. Look, are, do you really want to frighten little DJ? Do no, you- <laughs> I, 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 I care about him too much for that, but uh, I, I just, you know, even even though the pick, the first two picks, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm truly a true to heart, not upset about the first two picks. Mm-hmm. Just wish they would have happened at different times in the draft. Yeah. Um, especially with other people there. Me- meanwhile, the 49ers know? flip with Tampa Bay and still get the man that they want in Javon Kinlaw. I love great draft so far. Great draft so far for San Francisco. You get Kenlaw, you pick up, oh, is it, I don't know if his name, Brandon uh, Ayuk. Ayuk. Uh, and, and, and the kids got that, just another stud young guy that you have at the receiving core that it will eventually develop. Yep. Uh, and I just I just like what you guys have done so far in this draft. And, so, and plus, um, snatch up Trent Williams from Washington. Yeah. Snatch oh, yeah. up Trent, that's, that's, that's snatch up Trent Williams so Joe Staley can ride off into the sunset in 49er glory. And Trent Williams, I think, is going to don his number, 74. Of course, the last two great tackles for San Francisco, you should know these names, aside of Joe Staley. The other one was Steve Wallace. Yeah. Man, man, oh, man. And they get, this, and they get, a, nice, and they get a seven-time Pro Bowler. They get a seven-time yeah, Pro this, Bowler. This a huge pickup for the San Francisco 49ers. You know, and, and it makes sense. You know, they were talking about it a little bit um, – but it makes sense because, you know, he has a good relationship with Shanahan. Yep. Shanahan was the one that was there when they drafted him. Mm-hmm. He, he trusts Shanahan. So yeah. you go somewhere at least where you feel like you're going to be trusted. And they've got a team that is ready to roll for a couple years now defensively. And they're growing offensively. So, I mean, that, that NFC West is going to be tough. But if there's a team that can handle it, the 49ers can handle it. So, I mean, they just keep getting better. Lynch is probably one of the most – I still think, even though he's he's underrated, he's underrated he on how good of a GM he is. He's he is truly underrated, and we continue to see it. In the last couple of drafts, the Trubisky draft, and even though they got Solomon Thomas, and Solomon Thomas hasn't maybe worked out the way they wanted him to, all the picks that they got from it, that pick that they traded for Trubisky, and we see how how miserable the Bears are. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I go, I, I go back to that. I go back to that. I go back to that draft. With Trubisky sit sitting there, Frisco high on the Frisco high on the chart. They said, "Nah, we don't we don't want this." Hey, we got we we got a little special for you. And all the picks the 49ers got from fleecing the Bears so they can grab the man that they wanted one pick later, one pick later, right? One pick later. <laughs> and 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 that's what I'm saying. Like it, he's he's done brilliant moves, and he did another one. Like Ken Law is going to be a Beast. All right, so I, I got to go back a little bit. The, this he's such a smart GM because, and I'm not just tooting your horn here. I just like what I see as an overall yep. perspective. They knew. All right, we got to pay one of our guys. We got to pay Armstead, or we got to pay uh, Buckner. Buckner. Yep. They felt like, hey, Armstead got the most upside. Okay, we can draft another guy. We can get Armstead. And I believe Armstead's a little bit younger, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. I could be wrong. Yes. Uh, so he's younger. Let's trade Buckner. Get a high pick. In the draft, and, and, and Buckner's worth for every bit of the first round pick. Yes, he So is. you make that move, you get into the round. Now you got two picks in the first round. Then you go say, you know what? I'm going to take a step back, you know, and let the, you know, Bucks drool and get their, um, you know, get tackle. They, they yeah. probably wasn't going to take the tackle. You know what I'm saying? And they, they knew they wasn't going to take the tackle. Like you said, they knew who they wanted. Yep. They get Ken Law and they get more picks. It just, it's brilliant. And then they trade back into the round to get the receiver they wanted, mm-hmm. and they still they're not hurting on anything because they really didn't lose that much in that trade. I'm no, like, what a what a great GM. And then Jalen Hurt Jalen Hurt is waiting in the wings for Frisco. Remember, he didn't play last yeah. year with a back injury, and and San Francisco had so many injuries, and yet they still wind up thirteen and three. They make an appearance in the Super Bowl. They're the defending NFC champions, and then you got Jalen Hurd waiting in the wings. You get Brandon Ayuk of, of, from Arizona State. But they addressed the first major need, which was to replace DeForest Buckner. Javon Kinlaw is perfect for that defense. So young and so talented. So young and so talented on that defensive line. It's, it's almost it's scary. You know, um, 
and I, people laugh at me, and it's not just because I cover them, but I think the next team that you're going to have to watch out on the defensive front is the Washington. It's the Redskins, and, absolutely. And, and, and you and everything they've done on that defensive line. This is before they added Chase Young. Right, they were already good on that D line. Then you add Chase Young, and they had Matt Ioannidis, who you know he's a part of a rotational player. He had seven, eight sacks last year. Yeah, he's getting better. Mm-hmm. They got Tim Sepp. They, that that line. Is going to be special. It that may not Red happen Skins, right away. That Redskins team is that Redskins team led by Rivera is a couple years away from really making yep. some noise in the NFC. But for the foreseeable yep. future, the NFC belongs and will remain in San Francisco. <laughs> the way Shoot, John this draft, I, that's the way I feel. The way John Lynch <laughs> is putting stuff together, and a lot of people were worried. And I know you've heard this because you cover football like I do. A lot of people were worried that the 49ers were going to trade D. Ford and Quan Alexander for some more picks. No, no. John Lynch had something in mind, and that person was Javon Kinlaw. I I said it for a month that they were going to go after Kinlaw, and they got him. Yeah, I, 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 knew, I had a feeling it would be D-line, and to my better judgment, I kept saying, ah, well, maybe they'll go to receiver because, you know. But then I'm like, they got five young receivers that are yes. still growing. Yeah. You know, I mean – and they could probably snag a veteran. I mean, there's a couple of veterans out there. I, I mean, that's why I said, like, well, and I had, when it happened, I was like, it just makes sense. It's perfect. Yep. You trade your guy, you bring in, and you get a, a young stud that you want that fell right into your lap. Yep. And it's like, oh, well, like, well, this is perfect. It's, it's amazing, <laughs> GM. Amazing, GM. God, and, I wish I had him. And oh. it, it, it's, it's crazy the way John Lynch has turned around this football team with Kyle Shanahan working in concert, and they're not just set up for the next few years. They're going to be set up for a while, especially with this young, aggressive, hungry defensive line. I've referenced Nate Burleson quite a few times after the NFC Championship game, but I will say it again. With this 49er defensive line, with the addition of Kinlaw, who's going to play opposite of Bosa, this young defensive line is not only fast, but they get home quick. Right. It's scary. Um, and I think if you look at them as a whole, they, they have a it's, – there's been some great defenses the last couple of years. Um, yeah, the Seattle's leading the boom. The Vikings, even though they can't figure out things on offense sometimes, <laughs> they have a really good defense. <laughs> they, you know, uh, but I look at it and I say, yeah. the San Francisco team has a five-year window. Yep. In my opinion, mm-hmm. maybe three to five window. We'll say three to five year window to capitalize on this talent because eventually money is going to play a factor, and all yes. these guys are going to get paid. That's what happened in Seattle. It, it happened. It's starting to happen in Minnesota, mm-hmm. um, and it's going to happen. But they got three years to do it, three to five years to do it, and I think they can do it. I truly think they can do it. It's just really going to really depend on how do we control Patrick Mahomes. Yes, <laughs> we got to get on. We got to get a hold of him. It was uh, so an overachieving year for San Francisco last year because after the injury riddled year of 2018, you lose Garoppolo, who's your number one guy. You bring him over. You give him a big contract. So many other injuries that they had on every on every side of the ball, and then this past year they go 13 and three. You know the 49ers were real were were for real when they on Monday night football blasted the Cleveland Browns who everyone thought had won the draft and won free agency signing Odell Beckham Jr. and then the 49ers just said, "Eh, the hell with that" and held them to 3 points. That was a that was the eye opener, you know? I mean, that was that was the eye opener. That in the Pittsburgh game. Then y'all yep. beat if I'm not mistaken, y'all y'all beat Pittsburgh pretty good. And I and I remember <laughs> and I said, "Man, this this 49ers team is Low key, really good, and then as the weeks kept going along, and I'm just like, okay, I see it, I see it now, and, and then, then it just you you saw the destroyed Carolina. I have, oh that's my good gosh, Lord. <laughs> good lord! I, I was sitting, I was like, man, somebody throwing the towel. Where's the guy from Rocky? Where's my the, my, like, my wife oh, looked the at towel. the television. My wife looked at the television. She looked at me, and I had this big old grin on my face, and she goes, 51 points." Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> It's, it's, it was a bad deal, so man, it was like they were out there, man. It was just, it just watching it. I'm like, this team's good, and and I knew it, you know. Um, and of course, that was the I, first time they had the throwbacks on. They had the throwbacks that right. day against Carolina. <laughs> 
And then yeah, and the game in New Orleans. Oh, and what a game it was. I, I, I mean, it was a back and forth battle. You know, the NFC Championship game we all should have got. Uh, <laughs> I'll give you that. I'll give you be, that. Let's just be let's just be honest. Um, you know, and just watching it was just like, man, this is this this is special right here. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, watching it was just it was a piece of artwork. Uh, and you know, Kittle is a man, and and I, I mean, I got to see him play personally. What, what about last that? Year. What about that catch by Kittle against New Orleans on fourth and two? Uh, it was it was great. <laughs> And then, I mean, dragging people down the field. I'm like, come on, bro. <laughs> for another twenty <laughs> yards. Know, for another twenty yards. <laughs> another twenty yards. And, and that's that's the crazy thing. You know, I, I, when I when I watched San Francisco play Washington last season, you know, it was rainy. It was yep. it was it, it was, was a, messy. It was a mud yeah, fest. It was a mud fest. It was messy. But I remember telling uh, my man Tyrone Montgomery, who's a part of the network. Yes. Uh, he was with yes. me covering the game, and I said, Ty, I said Ty. this team is a Super Bowl team. I said this is a Super Bowl team um, because you can see uh, even in a in a muddy just a game that it could have went any way the dog fight in them and then just watching like I have a picture that I took during the game when Kittle uh, Kittle Babosa is sliding to me after yes. he sacks um, yes yes I yes mean, he slid direct it was directly towards me snowman I'll never forget it <laughs> yeah, I got the if, you, if I ever if I ever put the pictures up on um. On social media, I have it where he's running around the corner, and I, as a photographer, I'm saying, "Oh my God, he's going to kill him!" And then he hits him, <laughs> and you, I got the hit. As the, I got the hit as he's sliding on top of him, like he's sliding on top of me. You can just see his facial expression, and then he just, "I'm going to slide some more," and then he just slides it like he slid directly in front of me, and, and, and the whole and team, and, and the whole the whole <laughs> team, the whole defensive, the, the whole defensive line slid. <laughs> right. I can I can say that I was there when that was when that was birthed, and yeah. I can always say that, and that that was a cool feeling. But just watching that energy level of that young team and how hungry they were, they're mm-hmm. going to be just as hungry this year, you know. If so not more, it's, it's, if it's not gonna, more, coming off a tough. loss in the Super Bowl, if not more, right, right. So and, and with those young guys, it's tough. Let's dive into the first round of the draft while we while we have some time here. Tua at number five to Miami. You surprised with that pick? Well, we no, because I felt like this was going to be the pick all along. Um, other than I think they wanted Barrow for security purposes, and that's why they they offered Cincinnati that. Cra- I, have, I don't. If I'm Cincinnati, I'll be honest with you. There, there's no way I wouldn't have took those three picks. Right. I mean, there's no way I would not have taken those three picks. Right. Because you can drop back and still get you a quarterback at five, which we saw. And you could have still got two more picks. Cincinnati needs a lot to rebuild. Yes, <laughs> uh, and so it would it would have it would have been beneficial for them. But uh, I I pretty much knew once I knew that Cincinnati wasn't going to give up on Barrow and that, that they were locked into that pick. I said he they're going to still get him. Um, even with all the talk with Herbert, even up to the end, and even me and Jay on our mock draft, we had Herbert because we were starting to hear the whispers. But my heart kept telling me that now nah, two is going to end up going. He's going to go to Miami. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect spot for him. Um, the only I, I would have liked him in LA too because, and it, but it was more of a cultural thing for me in LA. Yeah. Um, I think he would have put butts in his seats, especially with the Chargers being the new Clippers. Uh, <laughs> and so they yeah. need, they need to be able to have somebody that can be the face of that franchise. And with the lineage of you know um, Junior Seau and what you know his heritage and you know yep. in that area, how important that would have been. I thought he would have been perfect on a marketing front. And with Tyrod Taylor there, they would have had time. But Miami does a good thing here. Miami's having a really good draft. Yeah, I mean, you catch, you go what? back and look at they picked up all the necessities. So yeah, I like what, what, what about so Justin? Fun. What about Justin Herbert to the Chargers? And I'm never going to correctly say the Los Angeles Chargers while this program is alive. And I already know that because Back. to me, they're always the San Diego Chargers. <laughs> they're I've all, been saying, I've been they saying are always San the San Diego, Diego Chargers. Chargers. They're always the San Diego <laughs> Chargers. Okay. Because it took me one year to get uh, L.A. L.A. Rams, even though it was old school, it took me. <laughs> it was a little bit quicker for me to do L.A. Rams, but I said St. Louis Rams on the program for at least six months. Oh, I know. Before it. I got it, and I know I'm gonna be calling the Oakland Raiders the Oakland Raiders for the next year. Listen, that's gonna take me some time. The Oakland Raiders are gonna mess me up. <clears throat> the The Las Vegas Raiders are gonna mess me up. The Los Angeles Chargers have messed me up because to me, it's still the Oakland Raiders and the San Diego Chargers. All right. It didn't exactly. take long for me to get back to the Los Angeles. <laughs> it didn't take me long to get back to the Los Angeles Rams. 
But you know what the NFL should do? And I know I'm veering off here. You know what the NFL should do? Make the Cardinals go back to St. Louis. Okay? No, you got a stadium there already. <laughs> you got a sta- you got a stadium there already that you can build something with. And, and hell, you can knock that down and build another one. Can we just get the St. Louis Cardinals back? Can we get the St. Louis Cardinals hey, back? Uh, <laughs> it'll be tough a little bit, Snowman. I, I mean, know. Arizona, done put so much, Arizona has put so much into that team. Yeah, they and have. And that stadium. They I have. mean, they have a gorgeous stadium out there. It, it would be a tough call, but they do deserve a franchise. Um, you know, and I, I hope mean, that they are make the next Arizona one another, one. Give Arizona another mask up. But can we just bring the Cardinals back to St. Louis? <laughs> can we bring yeah, them? the double double it up? Bring the Cardinals back to St. Louis, and I've said this one for basketball for many, many years. Can we please have the Seattle Supersonics back? Wow, when can we get the? Uh, that'd be nice. That'd be nice. Hopefully, it happens eventually. Yeah, you know, event- I mean, the, the eventually. Seattle the franchise. Yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah, they do. Are you surprised Jalen Hurts is going is going to Philadelphia? Was drafted by Philadelphia? Uh, I said this last night on um on uh, Facebook. And I truly meant it. I said, uh, hey, Philly fans, join the run your quarterback out of town club. And uh, mm-hmm. thank <laughs> you. I mean, it, it, it's it's one of those things where you look I – mean, Philly truly did need a, a good backup quarterback. They did. I mean, and yeah. it hurts is going to be a little bit of a development. So, I mean, I would tell people don't stress. And the same thing in the, in the Rodgers situation. Don't stress. You know, the only way that those two young quarterbacks will come into play is if the team is doing bad. Right. So don't don't do bad. Or or if their starters <laughs> are in, or if their starters play. are injured. Or if their starters right. are injured. Those are the, yeah. And those are the only two situations they truly have to worry about it. But it's good to have because for all the people that love the Philly special, well now guess what? You can bring old Jalen Hurts <laughs> in and he can do the Philly special. You he got, can, he can run it on his own. Another dynamic. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> He can, he yeah, can run that on his own. Dynamic. Does Tua become an immediate <laughs> starter in Miami, or I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so, so man. Yeah, uh, they should they shouldn't start him. They shouldn't start him. I would I would let I would let Fitzpatrick you know run it a little bit, um, give him as much time as possible before they have to force him in. I think he'll play this year. Yeah, he'll probably be late during the year. And and but I to be honest with you. The way Brian Flores, I love Brian Flores. I don't know what it is, man, but I just love <laughs> Brian Flores as a head coach. And yeah. I just feel like, you know, if they can if they can keep things afloat without it drowning, you know, let, let uh, Fitzpatrick, you know, usher in, grow them a little bit before you bring Tua in. But if he goes out there and he's lights out and he's killing them in training camp if we have one, you, it's going to be hard for you to be like, oh, man, man. we better have a training camp. We're not going to. <laughs> who you, who you telling? <laughs> Who's you telling? I'm sitting here looking like, man, this training camp a, don't happen. I'll be hot. Look, I mean, you know, you're you're not far from you're not far from me. They just extended the moratorium from the end of this coming week to May the eighth. I understand why they're doing it, but can we just lift the moratorium, please? I want some training camp, dog on it. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure there's not going to be no OTAs for the Redskins, and no, we usually travel up there. We travel up there last year uh, for OTAs, uh, and there's usually start the second week of May. Yeah, because um, they usually have the rookie one, and I don't think that's going to happen. No, it'll probably be like June. So if, if they have OTAs at all, it'll be sometime in June. But I doubt it. I'm just hoping that they have training camp here in Richmond, and that's all I can hope for. Um, you know, but we got a little time for that, and hopefully the stuff is cleared and, and, up. And hopefully it gets, and hopefully this curve bottoms out or flattens out. Right. You know, so and, and it flattens out safely. You know, let's not let's not get exactly. it twisted. Want it to flatten out safely and make sure everyone is safe when we do get sports back. And I believe we will. I'm waiting for the high school year to start back in August. Yeah, I definitely got to agree with you on that, so man. I mean, it's you know, it's it's you know, I've, I've been off I've been off of my um, full time for I don't know. It's it's been almost two months, and I've been a month about a month and a half, and I'm actually going back to work for the first time on Tuesday, which is that's good. You know, I've been sitting around the house for so long, <laughs> I've been sitting around the house for so long, but um, it, it's just one of those things. Just get some normalcy back, you know. Yes. Um, get back into what yes. we what our routines, and I didn't realize how much I, well, you know, miss sports mm-hmm. until they take it away from you, and they take it away from you like, oh, 
And I mean, you know, I mean, we're both out here trying to find something to do during our time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and it's, it's like the fan, it's, it's, it's like the, the players are, the players are locked out and the fans are locked down. Fact. You know what I mean? And, and can't do either one. No. We're just sitting here hoping for the best. Yeah, that's what <laughs> we're doing. For the best. The other half of the Legacy Makers Sports Podcast. This man is Darrell Owens, a very dear friend. I'm going to have him on the show often to talk some football. We will have some football this year. Thanks for coming on, my friend. I love you. Thanks a lot. Always, Snowman. Give my best wishes to the wife, and I hope uh, she's feeling better. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. tuned in to the daily bs sports and culture combined into one you know i want to start off today's program by telling you a tale of perseverance and this tale of perseverance involves a very dear friend in the industry i had her on four years ago And I've had her on recently when we discussed the death of one Kobe Bryant. But now let's get to some more positive times. The lovely Pamela Michelle joins me. How are you? I'm doing well, Brian. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to have you on. Okay. (laughs) I'm glad that we could be here talking a little bit more, (laughs) you know, about something happier. Even though it makes me happy to talk about Kobe, and it always will, but it's just nice to you know, have a little bit better of a circumstance. It, it's, it's great to have you on under better circumstances. And one Thank of the, you. one of the better circumstances is your show, the Pamela Michelle show. I <laughs> gave it a listen and it's now a guilty pleasure because it's a friend. Thank you. Vo- I, I, I mean this from the heart. People have said it to me for the almost seven years I've had this show. I returned the favor. This is you at its finest. 
and not giving a you know what about what people think or say about your program. It's you. It's something you you had to it, it's something you had to do. You and I have talked about this. So I want you to yeah. tell the folks about the Pamela Michelle show. Let her rip. Okay, well, my new podcast, The Pamela Michelle Show, and I did that on purpose so I could hashtag PMF just because I wanted to. <laughs> it was, I there's caught always that, some message it to was, my madness. It was, there is always some it, well, That is fabulous. When I, folks, when I caught, when I caught that hashtag, I must have laughed for about 20 minutes. When I saw <laughs> that hashtag, go on, tell the folks about it, your show. It's by design. It's by design to make people <laughs> laugh. I mean, uh, when I first started in this industry, I had a programming director tell me what a great personality I am. And it pissed me off. I was so offended. I was like, what? <laughs> Excuse me? Like, I want to be that girl. Like, I want to be, like, respected and thought of in the top percentile of people who are knowledgeable about fantasy football and who know their, sh- you know, their shit about baseball. Right. Like, I want to, like, be respected and think of, like, being a serious sportscaster. And I, I don't want somebody to be like, wow, you have a great personality. Yeah. That's what, you know what I mean? It's like... It was offensive to me, and I worked so hard, and I became that girl. Like I, I became the fantasy football girl. People wanted to interview me about fantasy football. People sought out my advice, and I beat everybody in Vegas. I beat the Sirius XM fantasy football champion. I beat Vegas bookies. I made the boys look foolish and stupid. I have Good. nothing left to prove. I have nothing left to prove in that realm. I know I am one of the best. Everybody can say, hey, this is how I do it, whatever. I know my way works, and it's been proven with results. Championships, and, you know, like I said, you can't get any better than beating people in Vegas who think they know everything and yep. making them look foolish when they leave Ezekiel Elliott in his rookie year just there for you to take. Yep. I, I mean, how can you Just pass that up? How can you pass up <laughs> yeah. Ezekiel Elliott? Okay. No, you, you, just, you just couldn't. I mean, I got super lucky. I had the last pick, and for some reason, like, all of these guys were just overlooking everything, overlooking everything, all laughing at me. You have last pick. Ha, 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 ha. And we were doing a snake draft. So I was <laughs> like, okay, I got last pick, but I get two picks in a row. <laughs> exactly. Care. Take who you Take who you want to take. And the way I constructed my roster, everybody laughed at me. I took two quarterbacks who actually had the same bye week. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't pay a lot of attention to bye weeks or anything like that. I construct my team to how I want it. And point being of it all, it was a 12-person league from these, you know, the creme de la creme in Las Vegas. And they left me last pick with Ezekiel Elliott and David Johnson. <laughs> I mean, that's a no so, brainer. That's a no brainer. <laughs> it was Ezekiel Elliott's rookie year. Yep. And David Johnson actually really wasn't hurt that year. He had a great year. The same right. year Zeke broke out and had this phenomenal monster year. And I took them back to back. And all the boys laughed at me. And the week, before I go back to talking about my show, the week that both of my quarterbacks were on a bye, I think I had taken Roethlisberger and Phillip Rivers maybe that year. I know I had Big Ben as one of my quarterbacks, definitely. I want to say Phillip Rivers might have been my other one, but they were both on a bye. And and the thing is about this league is you drafted who you drafted. There was no waiver wire. So I couldn't go to the waiver wire and pick somebody up. Your team was your team. So everybody's like, oh, my God, you're going to lose. You're going to lose. You don't have a quarterback. You don't have a quarterback. (laughs) I had Ezekiel Elliott and David Johnson. Sis didn't need a quarterback, okay? (laughs) Like, I just didn't. I I won that week, and I won very big. So the point was I was really offended. And now when I started thinking about what kind of podcast I wanted to come back with right now. We don't have sports and it's 
a little bit difficult. You know, you can still talk sports, talk about different things. It's hard when there's nothing that's being played. True. And, you know, so I really can't talk a lot about that. I don't want to do something I've already talked about before. I wanted to do something different that interested me. I got the best advice from somebody I used to work with. And he told me, do the show you want and be fearless about it. I know everybody's not going to love my show. I've gotten quite a bit of critique about my show saying, hey, you know what? I think you should take calls. You know what? I think you should do this. I don't get where you're going with this. It's not for everybody to get. It's supposed to be something for you to just put on, listen to, and laugh. That's what I wanted to do. I like making people laugh. I'm not trying to say I'm a comedian, but I do like making people laugh. And I came up with this concept of if people really knew what girls talk about, Sometimes guys would be like, wow, that's what you think. <laughs> and I know that there is, I know that there are podcasts that kind of already do that kind of stuff, but I feel like mine is a little bit different because it's not like I'm taking it exactly from that point of view. Right. The Pamela Michelle show is, I actually started off with something very serious, which was the topic of mental health. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for those of, But for people who know me, they know that I had a really hard time not that long ago where I was in a really dark place. Right. And, you know, I would just lay in bed. I would cry before my feet even hit the floor. I didn't want to get up. I just didn't know how I was going to fake going through my day. Right. Because the worst thing when you're unhappy is somebody saying, hey, is everything Okay. Because even that little phrase can force you to just bust out into tears. Yes. I would muster up the strength to put my feet on the floor and pretend that I was in a good mood and I would smile and go about my day when I was dying inside. I would go to bed and pray, if there is a God, please don't let me wake up tomorrow. Like, I just want the pain to stop. I want the hurting to stop. I just can't do this anymore. I just can't. And it was really hard for me to communicate that to people. And I had people that loved me, that wanted to help me, and they didn't know how, because I didn't know how to communicate, hey, I'm not all right. Like, there's things that are going on in my head that I can't even begin to understand. You know, I was driving my car and I pulled over on the side of the road and I just started to just break down and cry because all I wanted to do was put my foot so far on the gas and then just drive into a building. And then I thought, oh my God, not what if I die, but what if I live? What if it doesn't work? And those were some of the things I was thinking about. You know, I would just not answer phone calls. I didn't want to do anything. I just was in this horrific, dark place. I finally got help. I've been going to therapy, doing a lot of things to work on me. And in a way, this podcast is sort of my therapy. In a way, I talk about things that are, you know, important to me or things, random things that I think about. I came up with this whole bad girl Bible and the bad girl Bible. A lot of people asked me, hey, what's that? Is that like just a complete sex guide? No, not really. <laughs> it's not. It's not a complete sex guide. But <laughs> what it is the equivalent to... <laughs> is the bro code. <laughs> so that's sort of what the bad girl Bible is, is the bad girl Bible is the equivalent to the mythical bro code. Yes. And, you know, I had a, you know, I had a listener ask me, so how many rules are there? <laughs> I, I don't know yet <laughs> because 
I am still kind of making them up as I go along. Absolutely. If there's going to be if there's going to be ten rules, then you know there's going to be ten rules. I have two rules right now. The first one is never, ever, never, ever beg. The second is be the girl everybody wants, but not the girl everybody's had. <laughs> That is fabulous. Now you wonder why I love the sh- you wonder why I love the show because I love to laugh and my wife makes me laugh on a daily basis. I love <laughs> laughter. I absolutely love laughter. And since and exactly, it's the best medicine, it, and that's also is. why when I introduced like the logo for my show is this blonde that looks very iconically like Marilyn Monroe, mm-hmm. and uh, the whole slogan of it is "When Good Girls Go Bad." <laughs> that so, is, <laughs> that's like, just one of the reasons I had to have you back on the show <laughs> in better times. It's so good, it's yeah. so wonderful to hear you laugh. Because the first time I had you on, we we laughed and we laughed the entire time yeah. we were in we were in conversation. One of my favorite yeah. comedians, when I and I too can share your story about being in a very dark place, and it wasn't that long ago for me. And I'll piggyback on that after the break. But one of my favorite comedians is George Carlin, and right. I've listened to a ton of George Carlin. When I was in a mental hospital three years ago, you know, anyone who knows me or Mm -hmm. knows of me, which you do, you know, my favorite comedian is George Carlin. And one of my favorite routines by George is flying on an airplane. And my mom and my dad were the first ones I repeated this routine to. And y'all gonna have to forgive me because I'm just going to say it the way he said it. My favorite line in his routine of flying on an airplane about this time, someone's telling you to get on the plane. Get on the plane. Get on the plane. I say, fuck you. I'm getting in the plane. <laughs> <laughs> and I did I did that for my wife when we went on a trip last year. Again, folks, forgive me. This is the first hour, and we're kicking this off the right way with some laughter while this, mm-hmm. while this pandemic goes on to help us get through this pandemic. Man, that has been one of my lean-on lines when I go through go through a dark time but the best part about it i'm getting dressed to take my wife to work one day and i said it in the shower didn't realize it and i came out and i repeated it and when i got to that line my wife said it to me and i fell out laughing I've fallen. I have. I fell out laughing. It's that one or a Bugs Bunny cartoon or something. So, folks, our point is laughter will get you through this. I had to have this lady on the show to talk about hashtag PMS. Oh Lord, I'm going to laugh all day long now because when I first saw it, I started cracking up, and I'm going to make sure that it is a well recommended podcast for folks that really uh, get into laughter and want to find out a story about perseverance, I will continue to tell your story and I will definitely support your podcast. This is Pamela Michelle, a very dear friend of mine, the host of the Pamela Michelle show. And yes, you heard the hashtag correctly. Hashtag PMS. And if that don't make you laugh, then you don't have a pulse and you don't have a soul. Come on, y'all. Give this give this show a listen. I really, really recommend it. And I truly thank you for for coming on and sharing your story and sharing your podcast with us. Well, I appreciate it. And I really hope everybody likes it. I mean, I'm doing it for me, selfishly. It's a self-serving type of thing that I really hope everybody loves. I love getting the feedback. I always put things on Facebook and Twitter. The last I'm actually doing right now is, you know, fetishes and what are deal breakers. So, I mean, this is this is not your average podcast, folks. I mean, I, I know that 
<laughs> not everybody's going to love it. I know that some people that I've worked with really don't get it, and it's just not for them. And it's okay. Right. It's okay because I want to talk about deal breakers and fetishes. I mean, my last podcast was a good friend of mine who's a comedian, Marie Connor. Yes. We did, it was called Spilling the Tea, and I went mm-hmm. through my Twitter DMs and I made a game show. And I made, I read things that, like, dude, send me. And I asked her, I was like, okay, so the internet is a cesspool. Where do you think this came from? Do you think it came from Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or a dating site? <laughs> <laughs> you, I could, you know what? The next time you do that, let me know. Cause I could totally I turn, I could totally turn that into a Jeopardy setup. And just right, throw, exactly. throw it out. That's the I could, whole point. It was I could designed with a there. very like game show yep. type motif. You let me so know. You let me know the next time you do that. Doing, we'll definitely be doing another spill the tea at some point. I gotta let these creepy DMs build up. <laughs> I get them on the daily. I know I you do. do. I get them on the daily. I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> you, when they build, when they build up, you let me know when you do that. I will come in. You got it. I will virtually come in with a tuxedo on and put the spotlight on, and I will have so much fun with it. I would love to do that segment with y'all. I would love to do it. No problem. Absolutely. Oh, man. Pamela Michelle giving y'all a laugh to start the day. Thanks a lot, my dear. I totally appreciate the time. Thank you, Brian. Have a great day. the daily bs sports and culture combined into one with a special shout out to a furry friend of the show mishka who's a big old lovable husky its owner daniel sullivan of the fbas podcast now joins me to talk nfl draft and the fact that i love dogs 
and I love that picture of you and the Husky. I had to give Mishka a shout. <laughs> well, thanks. I appreciate it. She does, too. I know that. Uh, thank you for having me on the show, man. I'm really excited to uh, get this draft talk on. You know what? Everybody's saying Miami won the draft. Everybody's saying someone else won the draft. I'm going to be a little homerish for the first few minutes because the team that I feel really won the draft, if you can believe it, is San Francisco. Um, I actually don't disagree with that at all. I thought they really had a great job or did a really good job in the draft. Um, you know, we talked a little bit before the draft where we thought they might go, and you had mentioned Javon Kinlaw before the draft, and I said I thought he'd be gone because I think he's a top-10 player. Yeah. And for them to get him at 14 where they did, I think is a great get. Not only a great get, they can plug him in right away to fill the void left by the departure of one to Forrest Buckner. So once again, with the 49ers, you get four first-rounders on that defensive line. And if anybody watched them last year, that is a savage defensive line. Oh, most definitely. And I agree with the process of what they're doing is make one thing an absolute game-changing strength and make other teams adjust. And what they're doing along the defensive line is they just create absolute havoc, and teams have to adjust their game plan. And and I just love that strategy in a team. Yeah, and and they're going through it again. And also last year they took a receiver later on in the draft. Of course, that was Debo Samuel. In fact, they they took two. Debo Samuel out of South Carolina – and uh, Jalen Hurd out of Baylor. We'll hear from Jalen Hurd, I think, a little bit later in the season as he's come, coming back from a back injury. We know what Debo Samuel did, but then they snatched this kid, Brandon Ayuk, out of Arizona State, an absolute steal for the 49ers and that offense. Yeah, I agree, actually, which is crazy. Um, if if you do follow the FBAS podcast, we've spoken Brandon about Brandon Ayuk and, yep. and just how highly I do have him. I have him as my fourth overall receiver, and that's exactly where he, I think he went a little before that, actually. Yeah. Um, and, and I just think what he does is perfect for San Francisco. He excels after the catch, and he's extremely dynamic. And, you know, Kyle Shanahan's going to get his guys open. That's what the offense does. So you don't need – premier separation guys you need guys who are excel after the catch like Debo Samuel <clears throat> and Brandon Ayuk's just another player who's going to I think create havoc in that offense another player that's going to create havoc is along the offensive line as the 49ers executed a trade for one Trent Williams listen to this a seven-time pro bowler who still has a lot of years left replacing a six-time pro bowler in Joe Staley who has retired spent his whole career with San Francisco so now Joe Staley steps away. Uh, Joe Staley retires, but here comes Trent Williams to shore up that offensive line, and that old line gets younger and they get stronger. Yeah, I mean, it just seems like San Francisco's kind of like the, the new New England almost. They just find a way to get these veterans. You know, uh, like they got Emmanuel Sanders, you know, yeah. last year, you know, and loaned him out for a year and almost got the championship for it. And, you know, I now I, they now get Trent Williams. And, you know, I mean, that's a great get for a fifth this year and a third next year. You know, you assume it's going to be a late third because the team's going to win another a bunch of ball games again. Yeah. So, I mean, that's just a great deal. I mean, that's just a fantastic deal for San Francisco. What was the biggest surprise of the uh, first round for you? I think the big shock for me was Damon Arnett. Um, I just didn't see him as a first round player and, and I just didn't, I, I, you know, I follow this a lot and I didn't see a lot of people that saw him as a first round player. And, and I thought that just kind of shocked me. You know, you know, I thought, um, Oh, or Los Angeles or Las Vegas. I apologize. We, we just go a better. Yeah, I know. There's so many new names this, in this season. You know what? I I thought this. I I thought the same way, and I know I'm going to be messing up a lot of times this year. <laughs> but yeah, I thought that pick kind of just threw me for for a, a loop right there. I, I it, it kind of took me back. Yeah. I think the biggest surprise for me was Philadelphia drafting Jalen Hurts because to me it gave me a signal that it could be coming to the end of the Carson Wentz era in Philadelphia. Well, that I'm not entirely sure with because he just signed the five-year deal last year, the extension. Uh, but it's, I think what it does is it, if you watch the, 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 uh, 
pot, the draft coverage at all, you saw that Lewis Riddick mentioned the backup quarterback position is a top 30 position in the NFL. And I actually agree with that. And I think yeah. Philadelphia and Doug Peterson agree with that, where if you're starting quarterback goes down, you, you need a backup quarterback. And Philadelphia knows all about that with Wentz and his, his issues. So, you know, take a shot on Hurts and see what you can get. Are you surprised Tua went at five to Miami? Um, a little bit. I thought he would go three to Miami, um, but, I, you know, they just couldn't get a deal done. Uh, Detroit didn't want to give up their pick for what Miami was willing to give up, apparently. So, you know, it, it worked out perfect for both teams. They got both their guys, so nobody can complain. Joe Burrow went first overall to Cincinnati. No surprise there. How do you think he'll perform this year? I mean, honestly, I'm not entirely sure. I think the sky's the limit for Joe. Uh, his his confidence, his swagger, coupled with his accuracy, is just special. I mean, it really is special. He's got the the mentality of a winner, and the his arm is is really really special. So you think he could do well, but again, it's all about scheme and fit. You know, uh, David Carr had all the tools in the world, but, you know, he was in a terrible fit in Houston and yeah. his career went down the drain. You know, it's it's all about fit and finish right there. So, yeah. And, and that's what scares me about Cincinnati. You got a great athlete in Joe Burrow, but you don't have good athletes surrounding him. That's what frightens me about that pick. See, I disagree. I'm a big Tyler Boyd fan. He's got back-to-back thousand-yard seasons now, and I'm, I'm a big, big Tyler Boyd believer. I think A.J. Green still, if he's not elite, he's right on the cusp of, of yeah. an elite receiver. And then I, th- I don't hate T. Higgins. You know, I think he's going to be a very limited physically. Uh, I don't think he's going to be able to separate the same way he did in college in the NFL. I just don't think he has that separation ability at the next level. But he does high point the ball extremely well. He, he He's extremely long. So he's going to have his use in the NFL. But, you know, they're an up-and-coming team. You know, Joe Mixon's a really good player. So, I think they've got the talent around him. It's it's all what Zach Taylor can do with it, though, at this point. Yeah, yeah, I agree, I, I agree with that. So Burrow goes one, Tua goes at five. You know, Justin Herbert to the uh, – I know I'm going to say it wrong and I'm going to do it purposely. Justin Herbert to the San Diego Chargers officially signals the end of Phillip Rivers, who's now moved on to Indianapolis. Do they plug Herbert in immediately or do they wait? God, I hope not. Um, I'm a. I dislike Justin Herbert quite a bit. Um, I've made that pretty vocal on the FBAS podcast. <laughs> I'm, I, you have. I'm not a fan. Um, I don't think he has it mentally at all. Um, he he overthinks every throw he makes. He's literally he's thinking about the throw, not just going out there and doing it. And if you've watched anything in in the NFL, that never works. So yeah. I, I would hope they let Tyron Taylor do his thing and then let Justin Herbert kind of come along. But you never know. First round picks, especially six overall, they get pushed into the into the process a lot sooner than they should be. Probably. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to see how that goes. Let's go to Detroit. Julian Okwara, um, Okwara. Okwara. There we go. Okwara yes, out of sir. Notre Dame. You know, goes to the Lions. That a good fit for them? Does that give them any help? Um, it, it may. I, I'm I'm a little concerned about his fit in that in that defense. Uh, he's going to be. He's a tweener. I would say he's. I think he's more of a three four linebacker, three four outside linebacker than anything. And so I'm not sure how he fits in their four three scheme. But I mean, man, what a great score to get drafted and, and get to play with your brother there in the same NFL yeah. team and franchise. I mean, that's such a great story. And you know, I. Th- think he'll be able to fit his talent is amazing he had a he had a r- extremely high win percentage on his actual pass rush sets or, or, or attempts he just didn't have a ton at notre dame right <laughs> but you know you never know uh uh up, up there in detroit they're, they're building a whole new team and and i like what they did with jeff Okuda and aquara in there yeah jeff Okuda out of ohio state you know very high pedigree he goes to the lions Speaking of Ohio State, Chase Young to the Redskins. How big of a difference maker is that for Washington? Um, I think it's huge. I have him as a higher graded prospect than both Joey Bosa, Nick Bosa, and my, and Miles Garrett at that. I have him as the highest rated prospect as a defensive lineman I've had in a very long time. Um, he just does everything well. He's so dynamic at everything. His hands are 
extremely strong. He's he's got great technique. He's got secondary moves. His speed to power transition is already elite. Uh, I'm a big, huge fan of Chase Young. And like I said, what, like what San Francisco does, if you make one group elite and make other teams game plan, I think that's that's big. And so right now they got Montez Sweat, last year's first round pick. They get yep. Chase Young. They got Ryan Kerrigan still there. They make that pass rush elite. You know, it makes other teams change their game plan. And, and a lot of teams, if you look at it through the draft, are trying to follow the pattern that San Francisco set in setting that defensive line. Exactly. You know, that's a great point. You know what I mean? Like, the, if the defensive line and through the trenches is still where ball games are won. Absolutely. We're talking with uh, Daniel Sullivan of the FBAS uh, podcast. Let's go to Carolina. Derek Brown out of Auburn to start to solidify that defensive line. Your thoughts on Derek Brown? I mean, that guy's a beast. He's a he's a whole hunk of man yeah. in the middle of that football field. Bro. <laughs> um, <laughs> I really like his game. He he's you know a lot of people were trying to downplay him. I think before the draft because he really doesn't offer a ton pass rushing wise. Right. But but I mean, what he brings to the middle of a defense to be, just be able to stop the run and and just clog everything up i think is so important uh and I'm a, I'm a huge huge fan he's got two years of incredible tape in high end sec football I, I mean i think that's why he went where he did over you know other players i mean I, I just love his game absolutely looking at some of the defensive players taking Derek brown perfect fit for carolina out of auburn of course you know how i feel about javon kinlaw out of south carolina going to the 49ers the the Panthers are building their defense. The 49ers have their defense established, but they get an absolute beastified Javon Kinlaw. He's going to have to drop a little bit of weight, but then again, he may not have to because of how uh, Robert Sala schemes that defense. So it's going to be interesting to see how they play that. Henry Ruggs to the Raiders. But before we get to the Raiders, let's go to the Jets. Mecky Becton out of Louisville heading to the Jets as an offensive tackle. Do you plug him in right away? I mean, I think they have to just because they don't have a talent really better than him along the offensive line. I, I would love to not play him. I think he's the – out of the top four offensive tackles, he's the least ready to play right now. Uh, he, he's still really raw in pass sets. Uh, he's still got beat a lot. Yeah, he threw a lot of people around, but, you know, if, if you're able to, to get him lean in one way, you can, you can get around him and get him with a secondary move sometimes. So he'll have to learn a lot and with no mini camp. You know, we presume no mini camps and things like that. Right. Uh, I I think that's gonna that may hurt his you know improvements to begin his career. But I mean, God, people who are that big and move that well, you you're just in awe of. So I mean, if the the ceilings, the sky's the limit for yeah. Mackay Beck. Yeah, and and I'm I'm loving how how our conversation is going so far. Yeah, we're jumping all over the board, but folks, we're looking at every team. Here is the trade that a lot of people question but then realize what Tampa Bay and San Francisco were doing. They flipped spots. San Francisco was set to pick at 13, Tampa Bay at 14. Uh, San Francisco gave them a call and said, trade you. They traded, and they uh, Buccaneers wound up getting their man and Tristan Wirfs uh, a tackle out of Iowa. And, of course, with Tom Brady there, it's going to be – it's going to depend on a lot of protection for Tampa Bay. Yeah, I mean, I'm a Tampa Bay fan. I, I live here in Tampa Bay. Um, so I have my entire life. So I mean, I, I'm a blood, blood and through with those boys. And I was thrilled. Tristan Wirfs was my number one offensive tackle going into the draft. Uh, in our mock draft, I had actually selected him when I had the choice of any of the tackles I wanted at 14. Um, I, I love the trade. I don't think we expected him to be there in that range. Right. So when he was there, we. We were like, hell, let's just move up. Let's give what we need to to get the pick. And I know San Francisco has been very open and out that they were looking to move down and to only move down a spot and pick up an extra fourth rounder, which is huge for them. Yes. It was an obvious deal, you know, an obvious deal. And they still get their guy who they wanted, and Tampa got their guy who they wanted. So it made a lot of sense. Talk to me about C.D. Lamb to the Cowboys. Man. Damn Cowboys! I'm not a fan, and 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 they got a great player. I mean, a great player that just fell into their lap. Yeah, dude, and I man. I hated it. Um, 
because I just want to see them lose all the time. But uh, I agree with I, I that. Love it. <laughs> yeah, I, I you know I love the player. I love the pick. It's a very smart pick. I think again, I'm going to reiterate this a lot. You know, building an elite unit makes other teams adjust. And now you got Amari Cooper, Michael Gallup, Ceedee Lamb. Uh, Ezekiel Elliott, Dak Prescott, presumably he comes back, of course. Mm-hmm. You know, that offense is scary, scary good. Um, you know, I, I really liked it. Yes, they had other needs other places, but I'm always a fan of you draft talent before need. Uh, you don't you don't leave a, a top 10 talent on the board, you know, to take a player who may be ranked 10 or 15 places down when when it fits a need, in my opinion. You take that better player and you make him fit in your, in your team. Uh, so I love what they did. Let's stay in the NFC South and go to Atlanta. A.J. Terrell in the first round out of Clemson goes to Atlanta. Your thoughts on Terrell? Uh, I was actually a really big AJ Terrell fan. I, I kind of thought he'd be the third corner off the board. Uh, his his tape is just really really good. He doesn't get beat a lot. When he does get beat, he really you know he he rebounds really well and he, his recovery is really elite. Uh, I also you know he got beat up by Jamar Chase in the, in the national championship game, but I mean it's Jamar Chase. <laughs> it's, like, uh, thank you, it's Jamar Chase. Yeah, right. like the guys, the guy's gonna be a top five pick. So it's it's you know it's kind of like you know yeah he got beat up one game, but you know thirteen other games the guy was pretty elite. Uh, yeah, AJ Terrell, I believe AJ Terrell had a pick six against Bama in a championship out in Santa Clara. I believe that was the third did, play of that game. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, like he's he's long. He fits the scheme really well. Uh, so I, I I I thought it was a little early, but again, it takes two to tango, so they couldn't necessarily move down. So you know, I, I don't think it's it's a crazy reach, but I, I like the player a lot. Let's look at the Vikings. Justin Jefferson out of LSU goes to the Vikings, and this um, after they traded uh, Stephon Diggs. Do they plug? Do they plug him in right away? I would say they do. I mean, I definitely think he is a plug and play receiver for them. I mean, the guy's route running and just, I don't know, kind of keen ability to find those holes in, in coverage is, is pretty elite. It's, it's NFL level. Uh, my only worry with him is, you know, kind of, he's, he's kind of the same player as Adam Thielen, you know, so I'm a little worried that they're going to have to run the same kind of route tree. Right. And there's not really a guy to kind of take it deep, essentially. But, you know, uh, Justin Jefferson's a talent. You couldn't leave him on the board, you know, so I, I, I love the pick, to be honest with you. Jordan Love to Green Bay. You know, a lot of people were shaking their head and scratching their head about that pick. Your thoughts? Uh, I loved it. So I'm a huge Jordan Love fan. Uh, I, I think Jordan Love is an extremely talented quarterback. Uh, I think his arm is if you like Justin Herbert's arm, you I don't know how you don't love Jordan Love's arm, except Jordan Love has a better mental capacity for the game, I think, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I just think that's why I liked him a little more. Um, yeah, Green Bay is probably a ready now team to win, but you know, you got to always be thinking of the future. And if you get a player who can come in and, you know, he's a developmental guy anyway. So you get a guy who can sit for two years and then maybe be a franchise quarterback. You always pull that trigger. Always. DeAndre Swift out of Georgia goes to the Detroit Lions. Will he succeed there? I'm going to say no, just because no running back succeeds in Detroit. (laughs) <laughs> that, ain't named, simple. That, that ain't named Barry Sanders. <laughs> yeah, that ain't named Barry Sanders, like legit. And I mean, that was what ninety eight. You know what I mean? Yeah, like ninety eight was the last. That last year was the last. The last time they had him. <laughs> yeah. So you know, I mean, so the the the, the, the statistics say no, he won't succeed. I mean, the guy's pretty talented. I, my issue with him is one on one in a hole, he's not going to make that guy miss. Right. So and 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 I think you really need that in the NFL. Like, yes, he's explosive and can get outside and in a zone blocking scheme. You know, his his cutback ability is is pretty good. You know, it's it's right up there with with the tops. But I don't. I just didn't see a, a, a premier running back with with DeAndre Swift. So I don't. I think with carry on Johnson, it, it, it may create a really good tandem. But again, carry on's got to stay healthy. So you know, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Let's go to, and I'll, I'll give a shout to my wife, my beautiful Dr. K, for the next team we're going to look at. That is the Indianapolis Colts. And in the second round, they get Michael Pittman Jr. and Jonathan Taylor. Pittman out of USC, Jonathan Taylor out of, uh, out of Wisconsin. And you know Frank Reich's mind 
always thinking, always thinking offense, and they have to do a lot to to get better. They have to stay healthy, number one, and number two, the players that they pick up to put in their system already, I think, will be ready to go. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a really, really, really big Michael Pittman fan. You talk about staying healthy. Uh, the guy didn't miss a game the last two years of his of his USC career. Um, I'm pretty sure he also only had five drops in his entire USC career too, which is insane. The guy's got incredibly good hands. He high points the ball extremely well. You know, he comes from a Everybody knows his NFL pedigree, but what comes with that is an NFL work ethic usually. And that's what a lot of these college guys are lacking. He's going to come in ready to play football and ready to go. Oh, yeah. Uh, Jonathan Taylor, I'm not a huge fan of either. Uh, <laughs> I think <laughs> I think he's extremely explosive. Uh, I, I do like his running style. I think he, he has the ability to succeed in the NFL. Guy had 17 fumbles in 41 games at Wisconsin. Right. That's a that's a huge no. That's a you can't you cannot do that and succeed in the NFL. You really can't. Guys will get you guys will get booted out of the league real fast. So so that's my worry with him. If he gets that under lock, I mean I think that's a huge home run pick. But I mean that's a scary scary thing right now. Yeah, it it is scary, especially when Marlon Mack comes back healthy. And Mack was one of their biggest keys to their playoff run two years ago. T Higgins sure. at the top of the second round out of Clemson. To Cincinnati, immediate weapon for the Bengals, or are they looking for more? I think it's an immediate weapon for sure. You know, we mentioned earlier, I, I'm not sure if he's going to get elite, uh, or like really good separation in the league like he was able to get in, in college. But what he can do is is high point the football extremely well and be a really good red zone option for that team. And, you know, they do have to think about life after A.J. Green and T. Higgins might be able to learn a lot and what he can from A.J. and, and you know, get his game better. Those little nuances of creating separation at the very top of routes and things like that. And, uh, you know, T. Higgins could turn into something special because he has those elite traits. So yeah, I, I like the pick. And, and at the time, he was definitely the best receiver on the board. Yeah, absolutely. I'm shocked that Jamar Chase is still on the board. Shocked that. Uh, uh, not George. Um, shocked that the Chiefs selected Clyde Edwards Elaire to close the first round. Um, a little bit. I thought they should have gone corner. You know, I, 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 you know, I still think you know that team's ready to go. So just improve on what it is. I mean, you know, they decided that another weapon on offense would be worth it. I think he's NFL ready. He's going to step in. He's going to be able to pass protect from day one. He knows those concepts. He's ready to go. You know, that was really important in Joe Brady's offense. Uh, you know, also getting out and into routes, you know, he's, he's probably the best receiving back in, in this class. If not, you know, he's a top three in this class for sure. You know, he's just really good. And so I think he fits that offense extremely well. Uh, but again, you know, it's a luxury pick, but it's a luxury the Super Bowl champions can take most of the time. Yeah, a- absolutely. Just as the 49ers, they've done it for many, many years. Let's go to Cleveland sure. as we take a peek, uh, into the later rounds. So let's look at round six. Donovan Peoples Jones out of Michigan heading to heading to Cleveland. My early thought is this. Yes, John, Donovan Peoples Jones was targeted a lot at Michigan, but to me he didn't make that many catches. He really didn't make that many key catches just ask Ohio State. And now he's going into he's going into the state of Ohio number 1 and number 2, you got a quarterback who I feel has regressed in Baker Mayfield throwing to him. Is this a good situation for DPJ? Mm, I, I'm not entirely sure. Um, you know, I've got to see. You know, I've never seen Stabansky's offense. I don't know. I don't have any idea what he's going to run or what kind of you know concepts he's going to put out there on the field. Um, I do agree. Baker Mayfield has seemed to regress. Uh, that team's got a lot of options, so I doubt you know Donovan Peoples would see the field that early. I'm a little shocked he lasted this long. You know. I, you know, his overall raw talent, you know, and his his athletic body just seems like he would get picked earlier than this. Yeah. But, you know, he must, you know, he must have some, some issues that, you know, I just am not able to get to personally without seeing these interviews and blah, 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 and things like yeah. that. Um, but, you know, the guy's just pretty raw. And I think that's what most teams saw and they weren't willing to risk it that early. Yeah, that's that's true. Let's go back to the 49ers and their history of tight ends since 1981. Charlie Young, John Frank, Brent Jones, of course now George Kittle, and what hasn't George Kittle done? 
But then they snatch another tight end and Charlie Warner. I mean, Kyle Shanahan is trying to kill the NFC with tight ends. <laughs> Uh, again, I think it's just, uh, <laughs> I think it's his offense. And I think it, you know, again, just bodes to what I said earlier. He, he will scheme guys open. He's yeah. going to get guys open in his offense, you know? So if you can excel after the catch, you know, I think you're going to, I think you're going to do well there. And you know, that's, they found another guy here in, in this tight end who moves well after the catch. So I think that's, you know, what, what Shanahan's always going to target. <laughs> and, and he's, targeted quite well ross dwelly stepped in for george kittle for the two games that uh kittle missed with an injury had a couple key catches against arizona but you you know something who do you think right now give me your top five teams that you think won the draft have instant great players if not instant then they will fit in uh, throughout the course of the season give me your five best teams that won in this draft okay well i liked kansas city's draft a whole lot um at the at the top of it i think they got three kind of immediate impact players quite it clyde edwards alaire we spoke about yeah it's a luxury pick but again i think it's a pick that's going to pay a lot of dividends he's an extremely good receiving back i think he's going to fit really well into that offense um uh, willie gay jr out of mississippi state is probably the second best linebacker in this class but he punched his backup quarterback and cheated on a chemistry exam. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he he's gonna drop down, which makes sense. But but all the talk around the around the the draft was, you know, this guy's really you know understands how how he made a mistake and blah blah blah. So I think he he grew from that, and I just love that talent there. Uh, so I think Kansas City did a really good job. Um, I think Minnesota did a really good job too. Uh, Justin Jefferson uh, was, a, a, like we talked about, immediate starter. Jeff Gladney is an immediate starter, a perfect Mike Zimmer corner. Uh, Ezra Cleveland, I think, can step in at left guard, and then eventually, when Balaga leaves, which will hopefully be next year, he moves <laughs> over to left tackle. <laughs> uh, then he immediately moves over to left tackle. Do I detect a little bit of hatred in that in that statement? <laughs> I mean, Brian Balaga is terrible. I mean, let's be real. I think. Every Every Minnesota fan would agree Brian Bulaga yes. needs to be off that team. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and then Cameron Dantzler in the third round, I think, was a really good get. Um, I, you know, any any kind of SEC corner that exceeds and that succeeds in the SEC, I'm going to be a big fan of. Yeah. Um, I'm going to homer pick here. Uh, it's not extremely homerish. I do think they had a great draft. Uh, Tampa Bay. Right. Uh, like I said, Tristan Wirfs was an incredible get. I think Antoine Winfield Jr. is a stupid good player. Yes. I mean, I think he's a, yes. he's a he was a top 20 player on my board. So to get him where we got him was fantastic. Uh, Kashawn Vaughn, I'm not the biggest fan. Like I said, I didn't like really any running back in this draft. So I'm not the biggest fan of Kashawn Vaughn. But he, he's better than Ronald Jones, I guess, or he kind of at least brings the same thing. So, I mean, no, like, I'm going to call hate where there's hate, but the other two Please picks. Do. And then, Please yeah, do. And then I do it all Tyler the time. Johnson. With, I do it all the time with LeBron James, and I get so much pushback, it's not even funny. I mean, LeBron James hatred, we'll get that to a I mean, that's a whole, that's a whole episode if that's you want to go a, there. That, that's a conversation, <laughs> that's a conversation and a half I'll have to have you back on for. Oh, for because, sure. Because, because I, uh, well, well, a quick sidebar. I've had so many people tell me I need to evolve when it comes to NBA basketball. I hate to say this, but when you get spoiled by Magic <laughs> and Bird and MJ and Abdul Jabbar and my first favorite player of all time, which is Julia Serving, also sharpshooters like Ray Allen and Reggie Miller, shout to my wife again, you you kind of get spoiled. You get spoiled, oh, man. man. <laughs> we would have a great talk because I think I think the modern day guys would would run those old dogs ragged. <laughs> <laughs> so we would have a good talk, man. Ab- absolutely. <laughs> taking yeah. a look at taking a look at the draft in the later round. We're looking at round seven, and San Francisco's at it again. There was a name in wide receivers in the SEC that was buried for a while because of the young guns that came up. He's now in San Francisco. Jawan Jennings is now with the 49ers. So they're still wheeling and dealing, man. And for everybody who thought that they wouldn't have that many picks with the ones that they have, they've scored big. I mean, again, you're gonna, I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but guys that excel after the catch. Uh, Jawan Jennings had the highest broken tackle percentage 
of any wide receiver in the entire nation last year after the catch. Well, the guy just is a monster. He's a running back after he gets the ball in his hands. Right. And 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 I mean that's huge. I mean again that's huge. Uh, ignore the numbers. He I, I understand he ran a four seven. Uh, womp. I understand he didn't even he, he didn't even jump thirty inches in the vertical. Womp. <laughs> but but I mean you put the guy's tape on and you watch him run after he catches the ball and it's it's special. It's really fun to watch. It so, really is. You know to get him that late, you can't. I mean that's a great get. So Jawan so Jawan Jennings. We know the exploits of Debo, Debo Samuel, and if you if you think about it, not many people mocked Debo Samuel last year. Now he shows up in San Francisco and does what he does. The 49ers are busy stockpiling at every important position to make sure you know they they stick around for a while, and it's not just a three to five year window. They're really stockpiling at every key position, man. Yeah, most definitely. You know, I think they're building a team like how how you should build a team. You know, Kyle Shanahan's a really smart guy. John Lynch is a really smart guy. You know, they clearly know what they're doing, and they're building a team to last, not just win a couple of years and then be done. You know, they're building a team to last for decades and things like that. So it, it's really fun to watch. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, it, it it is fun to watch. I'm going to have them on later in the week to break this down division by division and team by team. It's Daniel Sullivan. Tell everybody where they can find you, my friend. Hey guys, don't forget to watch, uh, check out the ES or the A. Oh my God, the FBAS <laughs> podcast uh, on RTF Network uh, Wednesday oh, nights man. at nine PM, guys. <laughs> yeah, the RTF Sports Network, folks. It, there's a lot of fun there. This show is 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 featured there. His show is featured. I'd love to have you back on throughout the season so we can grade these draft picks and start talking football. Yeah, definitely. I'd love to be back on, man. It was a really good show. I appreciate it. All right. We got more stuff for you, so hang tight. Back in the deuce.
You're tuned in to the Daily BS. Sports and culture combined into one. All right. A lot of people know me. No, I'm a big, big fan of women's basketball. And I've been a fan of women's basketball for quite a while. So when I introduce this young lady who was the ACC tournament most valuable player this past season, and there's just so many records to list, I would just only delay the moment when I am proud to say, please welcome to the co- please welcome to the program from North Carolina State University and a hopeful WNBA prospect, Ace Koenig. She joins me right now. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Brian? I'm doing good. It's, well, except for the fact that this coronavirus has shut everything down, it's crazy. I know. It's being cooped up in the house, especially with no basketball to watch is difficult. Yeah. How difficult is it? You're a, you're a hooper. You've been a lifetime hooper, and there's no basketball on to like take your mind off of everything. I I know that's got to be tough. Um. Yeah, we're starting to get creative in the ways we uh, entertain ourselves. You know, there's lots of working out, but um, you know, doing uh, playing board games and trying to watch as many shows as possible just to get the day going a little bit. Yeah, it's 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 really really tough with everything uh going on. Tell me about this uh past season for North Carolina State. Very special season for you guys. You're the ACC tournament champions and then just when things seemed to get on a roll and this happened to a lot of teams, you know, the coronavirus just shut everything down. I mean, what's that do for your momentum? Um, you know, we were really excited especially coming off of that uh ACC championship like you said. Uh, we just thought we had a lot of potential and a lot of uh, basketball left to play to show off that potential. Um, we were a young team and we were really hitting our stride. So we were super excited to be able to go into the NCAA tournament and hopefully make a deep run. And, uh, you know, we were actually were heading into practice to prepare for the tournament when we found out. And we weren't allowed to practice because the ACC had said, you know, the coaches aren't allowed to host anything. Uh, you guys need to go home. But as a team, we decided to stay and hosted our own little practice without the coaches there and scrimmaged for a while to say our goodbyes. And um, we wanted to have a couple of few moments of Reynolds Coliseum. I um, think I know the answer to this question. Was it tough saying goodbye to your teammates with everything uh, being on hold and being up in the air? Uh, definitely. Cause you don't really get that same closure. Usually, you know, there's a game and you either come off a win or a loss, obviously, but you have that travel back then you have the rest that let go slowly. But instead, you know, it was kind of like campus is closed. Everybody needs to go home. Uh, you don't get that closure because suddenly everybody is, uh, scrambling to get home. And all of a sudden you guys are all in your respective, uh, hometowns without really the chance to have had that closure yeah and the closure is got the closure has got to be the toughest part again mixing in the uh, the season finish you guys winning the ACC tournament looking to make a deep run your name pops up in the WNBA draft and you don't get drafted which kind of disappointed me because I was looking forward to your name being called but it wasn't called what would be the next step for you um, you know, it's definitely a different type of scenario than uh, people are used to, especially with pandemic. You can't, uh, you don't really have any solid answers right away because you're not sure when you're going to be able to go places and whether or not leagues are going to start up again. So um, right now we are focusing on finding the right fit overseas, finding a team where I can really grow that skill set and be ready for whatever opportunity I get in the WNBA when it presents itself, there's always injuries. There's always uh, unfortunate circumstances. And uh, it's just about being physically fit and prepared to take advantage of those opportunities when they come. One of the best three point shooters in the ACC, Ace Koenig joining me right now. Who, who are some of the players that you look up to in terms of how you shaped your game? Um, I, you know, there's so many fantastic players. 
I actually grew up in a family of basketball players. So my very first role models were my aunts and my uncles and my mother and father. So those were the very first people before I even really knew how big a sport basketball was when I was just a little kid. Those are the people I got to watch day in and day out, play basketball and do well at it. So they would have to be my first role models. And then beyond that, you look to the pros, obviously the greats like Sue Bird and Diana Taurasi um, definitely would shape that. But I'd have to say my all-time favorite basketball player uh, would have to be Magic Johnson. Wow. Now that is a, now that's a role model. You mentioned two others, Sue Bird, Diana Taurasi. What do you take from what do you take from their games and what do you take from Magic's game, Magic's game to shape into yours? Um, you know, Sue is the type of and Diana are uh players that know how to win and will do anything to win and um it's that fieriness and that dedication to the game that I get for that from them and their performances. And then obviously Magic, just having fun with it, you know, he was the most exciting player. I did personally get to watch him. I was a little young, (laughs) (laughs) but I, uh, you know, being able to look back on his games and when they air them on TV, he was just the most entertaining person to watch. He was, you could never guess where he was going or what he was thinking. And um, that's the, what made basketball fun at a young age. And I think that he would just shape me and showing me that it's about enjoying yourself too. Are there any NBA players that you look at now to try to get a little bit more help in shaping your game? Um, You know, you look at, all of these fantastic players, you look at Steph Curry and LeBron James and Kyrie Irving and uh, Kevin Durant, and they're all fantastic. But at this point in my life, I'm trying to emulate uh, the greats on the women's side more so than anyone. And that, and right now, if I had the opportunity to uh, play a, underneath some of these fantastic female players in the WNBA, the Courtney Vandersloot, the Sue Bird, um, that would be the most exciting thing for me because, you know, I'm trying to be where they are and they've uh, shown day in and day out that they deserve to be there. One of the players you mentioned is a player that I used to cover for the Chicago Sky, Courtney Vandersloot, a very, very, very good shooter. But if you could have a one-on-one with a WNBA player of your choice or three separate games with three separate WNBA players, who are those players and why? Um, you know, I would have to say it had to go be Diana just because being, she's going to beat me. She's too good, but, (laughs) uh, being, being able to play defense against her, learn and study what she's doing from actually being in that moment, that would be, um, so incredibly exciting. It's kind of like when people say they would go and play one-on-one against Kobe, or Michael Jordan, and, you know, they'd lose every time, but they made them better. That's something that I would relish. Man, it's great to have you. Ace Koenig, one of the sharpest shooters in women's basketball. Man, if you, you hadn't had a chance to uh, see her play, look up look up some highlights, and I am personally looking forward to following your journey wherever it takes you and hopefully it brings you back to the WNBA. Thanks a lot for coming on. I truly appreciate it. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. That'll do it for this edition of the Daily BS. I want to thank you all for listening. Thank you to my wonderful guests. And I want to thank you, the wonderful fans that have tuned in in the region, across the nation, and around the world. Want to sponsor this here program? Drop an email to snowmandigitalmedia at gmail.com. That's snowmandigitalmedia at gmail.com. And also, you can find us on snowmandigitalmedia.com for a great replay of this show. And don't forget, the podcast version thereof is available immediately after uh, after I get the heck out of here, which I'm about to do right now. Have a great afternoon. God bless. Remember to make your next move your best move. And always remember, if your dreams don't scare you, then they are not big enough. Dream big, do bigger. I am, and I hope you all are, too. Until tomorrow, when I'm back at you again with another edition of the Daily BS, I'm signing off until 22 hours from now. So long, everybody.